Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I am in sunny Barcelona right now, about to head out to my annual pharma trade show in Europe. Or I'm in rainy Barcelona. It's hard to know because I'm actually recording this intro in New Jersey before I fly out on Friday, but I'm posting it on on Tuesday so I can be in time with the the pub date for the uh, this week's guest. And I'm packing light. I didn't want to bring a whole set of mics with me. So um, just play along. Pretend I'm already in Spain, would you? And to that end, I need to go get packing, so let's just dive into this week's show. So my guest this time is Adam Sisman, who has a brand new book out that is absolutely fantastic. It's called The Secret Life of John Le Carre. It's from Harper, and it's a companion of sorts, very much a companion, to Adam's amazing 2015 book, John Le Carre, The Biography. While Adam's earlier book really delved into the upbringing of uh, David Cornwall, the man who would become John le Carre, um, and really kind of explored the the myths and, and facts of David's life and the, we'll say the, the Shakespeare level evil of, of David's father, Ronnie, and the ways in which the, the spy fiction of, of John le Carre was received by the, well, by the secret world and by the general public and the circumstances of, of David's divorce from his first wife, Anne, uh, all of that stuff gets covered really, really well and in depth in, in the biography. This one goes into thornier territory. Um, Adam really explores the, the multitude of extramarital affairs that David had during his nearly 50 years of marriage to his second wife, Jean. And as we talk about, Adam in The Secret Life of John le Carré is not coming at this from a, a salacious angle. But in the middle of the 2015 biography, there's this comment that I, I cite in our conversation from uh, Le Carré, or David's second wife. We're going to call him David throughout. David equals John Le Carré. Just roll with it. Um, there's a comment from David's wife, Jean, about how no one can have all of David. And it's open enough to, to sort of um, leave the door open, I guess, about the various affairs David had over the years. And for Adam's new book, he explores those relationships, many of which were documented in David's letters and which Adam came across during the research in which he was exploring and trying to figure out how to how to incorporate that into this biography and, and well, also seeing how these affairs and the way David was handling them and the degrees of secrecy and spycraft or tradecraft and betrayal that were involved – sort of provides an avenue to understanding the novels of, of John le Carré. Uh, similarly, some of the, the women, as Adam is, is building these, these um, well, finding out their stories, clearly are, are some of the figures in uh, David's novels o- over the years. At the same time, this book also allows Adam to discuss some of the circumstances of researching and writing the big biography uh, from 2010 to 2014 or so, and how he and David came to to butt heads over what he was writing and why this book had to come out years later after David and Gene were both dead. Might sound kind of inside baseball, but trust me, I read both of these books in succession and loved them, Um, especially because this new one is now providing the undertext for the second half of the the first one. I like writer biographies when the writer actually has a, a life worth worth writing about. And I should note that I only got turned on to Le Carre in 2019 after uh, Amor Tolls kicked me in the ass for not having read him. I started with the, the very first Smiley novel. Uh, Amor's reading group had read all nine of the, the books that have Smiley, uh, George Smiley, Le Carre's greatest fictional creation in them. Um, so I started with the very first one. Not great. Second one. Okay. Third one is where the the well where John le Carre's reputation takes off uh it's called the spy who came in from the cold anyway um i realized belatedly what a mistake i'd made i 
plowed through all nine of the Smiley novels, started reading some of the others. Um, I have more than a dozen facing me here uh, at the shelf right behind my monitor, just guilting me about not having read them yet. The thing being, while they're great spy fiction, they are... I don't want to say they're more than that in a way that says, oh, no, no, spy fiction is, is in some genre ghetto. They're deeply spy fiction novels. And in the process of what John le Carré, David Cornwall does, these books provide a window into an England in decline and a perspective on, on what the Cold War meant in the lives of the, the people fighting it and in the later half of his career, they explore some other issues, many of which go into the decline of England, particularly through Tony Blair's, we'll say, subservience to, to the U.S. So what I'm saying is the spying and the, the trade craft, uh, they're all integral to these books. But it's it's how David reveals personal and national lives and, and betrayal through them that, that makes the fiction special. And to that end, given the nature of, of spying and, and betrayal and the need to adopt false identities and, and cover your tracks and, and lie to the people who trust you the most, it sort of makes David's affairs an intriguing way of, of exploring the books and the life of their author. Even an author who spent a lot of time creating various mythologies about his, his own spying career and uh, the people he knew and didn't know and, and well... Some of these myths that, that David Cornwall may have come to believe himself uh, after telling them enough times. Anyway, all of that said, I can understand why Adam did not do this in the 2015 book, given the sensitivities of David and his wife still being around and other figures he would have had to speak to and kind of get their stories in. And it would have sort of taken you away maybe from some of the the... Well, the deep chronology, we'll put it that way, of the, the novel itself. Those of you who are in the know know what I mean. Um, but I am glad that he, he made The Secret Life of John Le Carre, and I'm glad that David's family um, were on board with this this project. Um, they've even put out John Le Carre, the letters of John Le Carre, some of which include uh, uh, letters to some of the women he was having affairs with. But the thing is, Le Carre is a huge figure in post-war, we'll say English language fiction, and he deserves a biography and an annex, as as Adam describes this project, by a writer this good, because that's while Le Carre's story is interesting, his upbringing, the the sheer, like I say, the Shakespeare level evil of his father. It takes a writer like Adam to really build the story and and give us this life and write it in, in really clear but flowing prose and get at what matters and what doesn't matter in the, the course of a life like this and a life that's built around secrets, secrets and fiction. Anyway, all of that is to say, if you are a Le Carre reader, go read Adam's new book, The Secret Life of John Le Carre, after you've read the biography. Go read the biography first. If you're not a Le Carre reader, don't make me go all Amor Tolls on you. Do yourself a favor, pick up The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, then follow George Smiley, Le Carre's greatest creation, as we've said, uh, through the course of the, the Cold War. And make sure you read uh, his greatest non-Smiley novel, A Perfect Spy, which is the maybe the closest thing David came to a, a true autobiography or memoir. And that includes the late life memoir he wrote to maybe submarine Adam's biography, um, a book called The, the Pigeon Tunnel. Anyway, I'm going to go finish packing, drive out to Newark and enjoy sunny and or rainy Barcelona. Uh, while I'm there, I may check out the new Errol Morris movie on Apple TV uh, about Le Carre, which is also called The Pigeon Tunnel. Uh, here's Adam's bio. Adam Sisman is the author of Boswell's Presumptuous Task, winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award for Biography, and the biographer of John Le Carre, A.J.P. Taylor, and Hugh Trevor Roper. Among his other works are two volumes of letters by Patrick Lee Fermer. Uh, these being British names, I may mispronounce all of them drastically. Anyway, Adam is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and an honorary fellow of the University of St. Andrews. And now... The Virtual Memories Conversation with Adam Sisman. Mm -hmm. 
when did you realize the secret life of John le Carré would be necessary? Good question. Um, <laughs> it's quite complicated to answer because I, um, as I was writing the biography um, back in the first half of the last decade, um, I increasingly came across material that would be problematic. And in fact, I decided that the best way to proceed with John le Carré, whose real name is David Cornwall, and whom I'll refer to as David, if that's all right, sure. um, um, was to tell him everything I discovered. And he expressed uh, concern, increasing concern. <laughs> so I knew that there were some things that I couldn't publish in his lifetime, or it became increasingly clear. And at first, I had thought that I would produce a revised edition of the book uh, after his death, um, that I'd keep a, what, what, what his son Simon called a secret annex for, for publication after his death. But um, it became clear for various reasons, some, some of them publishing reasons, that uh, it was better to do this as a separate book rather than try and uh, integrate it into the uh, to the book that was published in 2015. So the secret annex is semi-detached <laughs> to continue the real estate metaphor. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it struck me. I, I was very thankful for the book. And I, I apologize. I'll do a lot of gabbing when we're, we're doing this, but this is me thinking things through while we, we talk. The In the biography, there's a first instance where you sort of jump chronology about 320. Well, I've got it on page 320 when, when you're discussing his marriage with Jane and the infidelity or the extramarital adventures, as you, you phrase it. And from there, the book changes tone in a sense and becomes sort of a present or an ongoing David, as opposed to the David in each of those moments is going along. And you, I mean, you, you reintegrate that as you start rebuilding the chronology and the, the novels. But it really did seem like the, the marriage to Jane creates a different phase, both in his life and, and how you try to, to capture it and document it in the course of the biography. So um, I, I'm glad that this exists to sort of, you know, rewrite the picture, I suppose. Yes. Uh, and the reason for that was, of course, that I raised this issue with David, uh, or, and he uh, increasingly raised it with me, and we agreed on a form of wording. I'm not particularly proud of the fact that I uh, accepted his um, revisions to my drafts, or I can't actually remember, possibly it was my revisions to his draft. There was a, <laughs> a little bit of both um, uh, for that passage. But there was there was a way we just had to get over that hurdle, and um, I mean, of course, it's it is very difficult to write about a living person. That person is, you know, has he's in his case he he's married. He's been married to the same woman for fifty years, or getting on for forty five years, I suppose it was when I um, was working on the book. Um, and he has family. He, they had a son together. He has stepchildren. Uh, uh, he has children by his first marriage um, and a network of relationships that would have made it very awkward for all of this to come out in his lifetime. So, I mean, it. Uh, whereas for me, I didn't really want to wait until after he was dead. I, you know, uh, I might not have been still alive myself. Um, uh, and uh, who knows? Um, no one ever knows when, when death is going to come. So um, I, I did want to publish it. Uh, publish a version in his lifetime, but I, I did also want to get this extra material on the record because I think it is important. It's it's not just gossip or tittle tattle. It is um, a key component to understanding. Well, as I say, um, how, why, um, and and where he wrote. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit more about that? How, uh, because obviously the knock is, why does anybody need to intrude on someone else's sex life, blah, blah, blah. But I think you make a very good case as to why it's critical 
to well, an partly, understanding of, of him, if you could speak on that. Yeah. Yes, partly it's his own statements. I mean, he said that it formed a kind of drug that uh, was a necessary fuel to his writing. So, so that's not me speaking, that's him speaking. Um, and I think in this case, he is being honest. Um, he seemed to need a, a certain amount of jeopardy in his private life in order to create uh, the tension, the drama, the, the excitement, the fuel for for his work. Um, it was also true that he, um, some of the women he was involved with became characters in uh, the heroines, if you like, of, of, of his novels. Um, at, a, at an early stage, uh, um, someone who influenced him very strongly in both positive and negative ways, James Kennaway, said to him, you need a new woman for every book. And David seems to have taken <laughs> this that literally. Woman was David, oh, James's wife, but, but yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Well, that was, you know, she was one of the first, yes. And, and when you consider that he wrote 26 novels, well, um, as I said the other day, do the maths. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure it stopped at 26 either. And in the book, you talk about in, in the initial biography the longing for stability because of the the chaotic, we'll just say chaotic upbringing and childhood that he had, versus this need for. Do you want to say love? Do you want to say deception, or betrayal? I think it's you know, both. What, I think the yeah. two are wrapped up in each other in his mind. I mean, I think in fairness to David, we should say something about his. Uh, childhood for those who might not know he his father was a uh, a major league con man who um, robbed people of their life savings and uh, at one stage had uh, an interest in no fewer than four thousand houses um, who served two prison terms but for the rest of the time uh, lived like a millionaire um in with uh, rolls royce cars chauffeurs racehorses um, meals at the fanciest, swankiest uh, uh, restaurants and hotels. So um, uh, that was a very strange household to be born into. His mother um, couldn't take it. His father also was a serial philanderer, um, and his mother stole away in the night, leaving her two boys when David was only a little boy, only five years old. He didn't re ever really know his mother. So his first experience of women was of a woman who abandoned him. Um, and um, uh, he didn't see her again until he was an adult. And then he didn't like her very much. So it's, I think, not too far-fetched to say that for him, women were people that he didn't trust that might have abandoned him. And in general, his policy seems to have been to make them love him and then abandon them before they could abandon him. Yeah, even, and I know a perfect spy gets hauled out an awful lot when, when it comes to, to trying to decode David versus uh, the the author. That sense of, I, I think there's a, a scene once where he's speaking and there's a, a the, the father speaking, there's an audience where someone is not appreciating what what the figure is doing. He has to seduce that one person to make sure, you know, this this I need that approval and that sense of of need, I guess, from the, the other figure. I do Knowing that, you know. David had, I mean, this characteristic himself, he just had to seduce everybody, if not literally, then at least mm -hmm. emotionally. And I felt it myself. He, 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 when he turned on the charm, I don't think I've ever met anyone who, who was such an um, intoxicating company. He was uh, very funny, very intelligent, um, uh, very generous, um, and um, uh, seemed very sophisticated. The thing was, you could just switch it off again. Um, uh, there was a sort of uh, the other side was very cold. So uh, a, 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 um, um, a friend of mine who knew David well, uh, Nicholas Shakespeare, who uh, also wrote a biography of Bruce Chatwin, compared him to Bruce Chatwin and said it it didn't re really matter whether you were a, a woman, a man, or an ocelot. He just had to seduce you, and and that was true of David. He had to seduce you. How challenging was that for you as a biographer? And did you see connections between David and, and Ronnie and yourself and, and the relationship with David? Or were you very cognizant of, I'm an adult, I'm, I'm not 
Well, anyway, tell me how difficult it was as a biographer. I just kept reminding myself that we weren't really friends. And um, as I often, when I had been with him and was walking away, feeling um, you know a sense of bonhomie, I would just say, you know, just remember the other side, say to myself. Um, uh, it was It's very peculiar being a, a biographer of a living person because you get very close to him in some ways. I mean, in some ways, I know more about David than anybody else alive or even dead, you know, um, uh, uh, that, that uh, um, even in some ways than his, his own sons uh, do or did. Um, uh, um, and that's a very odd position to be in as a comparative stranger. And that notion of inserting yourself into the story, as as comes up in the new book, you, you have to talk a bit about your interactions, the the publishing history, some of the other uh, issues that came up in the the course of it. Um, how reticent were you, a by being a biographer, b by being English, to to put yourself into the story? <laughs> in, in <that> way? <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> um, well. Uh... I mean, actually, my friend Nicholas Shakespeare, who I mentioned just a moment ago, said to me that when he read the book in, in TypeScript that he thought that the most interesting relationship in the book was not between David and any of his mistresses, but between David and me. Oh, totally. Um, and, and, and that's what I'm getting at. That, um, that's the stuff I find absolutely fascinating. So. Um, uh, and he said that uh, he thought that David wanted to sort of, was always sort of seeking to know himself, partly in his own fiction, he was seeking to try and find out about himself. And he said that the biography perhaps was another form of this. But when I held up the mirror to him, he recoiled in horror at what he saw there. So that's that's perhaps one way of looking at David's side of things anyway. Yeah. How did the project change from what you you thought it was going in? The initial book, I mean, and then, of course, uh, this, this um, the annex. Well, not hugely. I mean, yeah. um, uh, I, I mean, what startled me really was that David seemed to uh, change or forget what we'd initially agreed. He'd always said, he said at the start, I, I, I think the only kind of biography that should be written is an arm's length one where you can write what you like and I won't interfere with what you, 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 you choose to write. But pretty soon he seemed to be, adopting almost the opposite policy and being surprised that I wasn't just um, uh, putting down in words what he himself had said to me. He, he complained that I didn't believe. He said, why, why don't you believe what I say? Why do you believe other people and not me? And I, I said, well, that's because, David, as you have often said yourself, um, I'm a liar. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, I have to treat everything you tell me with sceptically. And he seemed rather surprised by this. He seemed to have almost sort of um, come to think of me as a, as a kind of ghostwriter or as a kind of uh, uh, faithful stenographer. Um, and so anyway, he, he clearly didn't like that. I mean, some of the passages that he asked me to, that he was troubled by, were not about his private life, but were by things that might have shown him in a less than perfect light. Having said all of that, I was and remain uh, an admirer of his work and particularly his best books, I think are major books. And, and, and are, um, I, I still think he's the definitive novelist of the Cold War. And he's also a, a major novelist in trying to understand Britain's post-imperial struggle, sleepwalk, if you like, um, um, uh, in, 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 in Britain trying to get used to its much diminished role in the world. Um, which um, perhaps is more interesting for us than it is for you, but it is uh, maybe will happen to Americans at some stage. We, we all make a study of empire, well, yeah. regardless of whether it's yours or ours. But <laughs> yeah, I have to say, I didn't start reading them until just maybe a, a year or two before the pandemic, when I was recording with Amor Tolls, the the ar uh, author in the US, oh, yes. did a, a gentleman in Moscow, yes. and he mentioned how his reading group had just finished doing all the smiley books. And I said, you know, I never picked up like her. He said, Gil, come on, and shamed me into it. And I, I, I started at the very beginning in those first two novels. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I made my way through all nine of the smileys, started picking and choosing elsewhere within uh, uh, Le Carre's work. But yeah, same thing. It was one of those, not just great spy novelist, great novelist who 
you know, was writing in this this genre I, and doing it very, very well. I but, think he, I mean, it's very interesting about him that he that he really divides people, and that that uh, that you you will hear um, um, very different opinions from, for example. I quote in, in the in the original yeah. biography, Anthony Burgess or Salman Rushdie, both of whom were they were they could, they recognised that he had a lot of talent, but they 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 wouldn't accept that he was a major novelist. Or, but in contrast to that, you somebody like Philip Roth, um, who said that A Perfect Spy was the best English novel since the war. Full stop. Um, uh, Andrew so, Updike trashing him and, and lumping him in with, with the Tom Clancy's of the world. Yes, and, yes. Well, yeah. that's just that's very funny. You know, I thought uh, Updike, incidentally, yes, a friend pointed out to me, having just read this, it sent me a, an email um, just over the weekend saying um, that he noticed that, that two writers um, uh, suffered, a, not a breakdown, but were very upset after... Um, an Updike review. Um, a Roth himself, um, mm -hmm. I can't remember which book it was now, um, but um, was, was deeply upset after a, an Updike review and and uh, and the carry. Um, um, and uh, it, it reinforces what I often think that uh, um, we underestimate the impact of reviews. I have a story I can tell you off mic later on about an author I know who was destroyed by another one uh, because of a review. I, I, I only found this out through mutual friend authors who I was, I was hanging out with at a festival who were just – not just that it was an unfair review, that it was so damaging. This this guy couldn't write for a year, and I thought, well – yeah, that's that's awful, and I know the person who wrote the review, and he's not a good person either. But anyway, that's that's uh, again, it seemed like the literary gatekeepers, in a sense, you know, trying to keep the genre guy out. That you know, you're popular, therefore, you know. Uh, yes, I think yeah. some people are much more sensitive to reviews than others. Uh, David used to pretend that he never read reviews, yeah, and and quite a lot of authors do that. Uh, I personally never met an author that doesn't read reviews of course everyone does and i do uh, everyone um uh, you long to be re noticed and uh, um and of course you long to be praised but um some people are much more sensitive to criticism than, than others Th this i one of the things that has interested me about the reception of this book which so far as i don't think i've had an american review yet except for the kirkus and the pw publishers weekly but um, uh, uh, is is the British reviews are very they go off in different directions, completely different directions. So that you might think that they were reviews of, of different books. Um, I I've, I've, I haven't quite experienced that before, um, and um, it's it's quite interesting and and perhaps shows the preoccupations of the of the individual concern. Yeah, Airmail had one this morning or uh, yesterday morning that the, the Graydon Carter. Uh, newsletter oh, yes. online magazine whatever but it veered so wildly into just david lionization that i was just like not really telling us much about adam's book but whatever that's that's <laughs> you know they had an agenda or they had a, a an area they wanted to follow but well as i say i, I you know as a writer i admire him enormously and it's very, it, i mean that's another odd thing about biography is you get to meet people who you may have been reading for a very long time and who you have admired from afar, and suddenly they're there sitting you know, just a few feet away from you, and you realize that they are people. They're not just the, the name on the title page um, or right. on the spine of the book. And it, it is a bit strange. I mean, uh, I don't know. I can't who it is who says, never meet your heroes. Um Oh um, yeah, no. I, I I tell the story on this show from when I recorded with Irvin Welsh, the the, the guy who wrote Train yes, Spotting. Yes. That uh, I, I believe he told me he stood up David Bowie twice for interviews because both times he just freaked out. And I can't sit down with the person whose posters I had on my wall when I was a, a teenager. <laughs> There's just yeah. no way I can do this. And he just freaked out and 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 left David Bowie. You know, sitting yes. at the table, I guess. Yes. But. Well, I, I won't say I had Le Carre posters on my wall, but I, I did on my metaphorical wall, um, yeah. if you like. I sat and you and do you remember I mean, your first uh, your first uh, Le Carre book? I think it must have been The Spy Who Came From The Cold. I must confess I approached him via the film. Um, mm -hmm. I saw the film when I was, I don't know, 
probably only about 12 or 13. It was one of the first adult films I ever saw, and it made an enormous impact on me, probably because I hadn't seen many serious films before, but also because it remains a very good film. It's, it's, uh, there's an interesting sort of subtext to that film, which is about a, an awful lot of the people concerned, including the, 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 the director, had been victims of McCarthyite persecution. Um, and several of the, the, the leading actors had two, and so there's a that, that, that's a kind of um, that, that thread running through it, um, um, which perhaps very much suited the sort of morally ambiguous um, nature of, of the of, of the plot, and in, in which uh, British intelligence is shown to be just as unscrupulous and and, and morally dubious as, as as that of East Germany or, or the Soviet Union. Let me ask in a metatextual way, do you see this new book as a creative rewrite a la Legacy of Spies, <laughs> where Ori Le Carre rewrote Spy Who Came In From the Cold from the Next Generation's perspective? Mm, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, I know. No. That was one of my more obscure moments of, you know, in a sense, this book is giving the story underneath the biography, which a Legacy of Spies kind of does. And it's, it's you know, these it were is, who these people were. I do think there is life. an element of the story behind the story. And I think... Um, for people involved in the whole business of writing and publishing and and and, and reviewing and so on, uh, that I, I hope that will be of interest. Um, mm -hmm. It certainly intrigues me. I was always I always felt there was something here, and quite a lot of people didn't. And uh, um, uh, I hope I'm not breaking a confidence when I say my agent wasn't particularly keen on. Uh, this idea and said I was becoming obsessed with Le Carre and I needed to move on. Um, uh, um, and uh, um, there is a danger, of course, um, that one does become obsessed with the subject and I can't see it in perspective. Um, yeah, I think, it, oh, sorry, go on. No, no. Well, I mean, I think the other side of that is that I didn't, I mean, some of the reviews, uh, the British reviews anyway, have been uh, critical in the sense of, isn't it a bit early for us to be knowing all this stuff? Or, or, or um, uh, they've sort of kind of been uncomfortable with David's private life being um, resurrected, even though I took care to make sure that the family were were okay with it. Um, uh, and I, you know, I I think well, when is when is it okay? I mean, we don't don't we like to know that Dickens had a had a you know secret woman. Um, uh, um, we do. We think it adds to, adds to our understanding of him. Or you know, going further back, that Wordsworth had an illegitimate child, or, or, or you know any number of um, of authors from the past. But but maybe maybe I should have waited for a decent interval. I don't know. I, no one knows what's what's decent, and there's always that too soon uh, uh, question. But uh, yeah, honestly. <sighs> Yeah, I, I don't see it as a. It, you didn't wait until the week after his uh, his wife's death to to publish this. It's not like it was it was instant, but um, that feels well, uh, appropriate. But go on. And, and also, there had been there was the kiss and tell memoir by one of his mistresses, and then yeah. his own son Tim produced a volume of letters which made it clear that he'd had various affairs and and indeed identified one mistress that I had I hadn't known about. Um, uh, um, Perhaps one of the most intriguing of his affairs, because it was conducted almost almost entirely by correspondence, yeah. um, uh, which I found fascinating. That that particular chapter, I, it is I, extraordinary, I, isn't it? Absolutely extraordinary. And I've I've talked quite a lot with Susan Anderson, the woman concerned, who I must say I respect a great deal. Um, she, um, but um, it is uh, his powers of seduction, even on the page, are remarkable. So tell me about the, I guess the the self invention of Le Carre and the the self deception of of David, as you again delve deeper and deeper into a the work, b you know the the conversations with him, and c you know the the rest of the research. Well, um, the self invention I think starts very early in his life. I mean, um, one thing that I one aspect I talk about in the the, the 2015 biography is that when he was a schoolboy during the war, 
his father was that most despised of, of individuals, a, 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 a black marketeer, a spiv. Um, it probably doesn't quite resonate with Americans as much as it does with Brits, but, but during the war, um, the idea that people were making money out when, when most, uh, some, uh, most individuals were fighting, or, or at least potentially fighting, um, was repulsive, and those people were really... I mean, perhaps you have to go back to carpetbaggers and in the American Civil War to get some of the same resonance. Um, but anyway, um, uh, so David was right, rightly extremely ashamed of his father, and he invented a totally fabricated story that uh, um, his father was really a secret agent being parachuted into occupied Europe. Um, uh, but he couldn't really give any details about this. And that was, if you like, one of the early bits of self invention yeah, as a as, a, as a, someone who has a father who was a con man, I, I weirdly respect Ronnie for the um, the ambition and the ability to follow through, which my old man never really demonstrated. But yes, I, I get the sense of um, trying to create something that's more plausible or at least more more romantic than you know the the, the life that yes. you were. I mean, uh, well, it's, it's fascinating to hear about your father. I, I had a grandfather who was a con man. And I, who I, well, I say I never met. There was a photograph of him holding me, but he died when I was only an infant. But, but um, uh, uh, I think that Ronnie was a very bad man indeed. Uh, he was probably extraordinarily good fun to meet. Um, uh, as his his older uh, David's older brother Tony had a good phrase about him. He, you could have one hand on his shoulder and the other in your pocket. <laughs> um he um uh he 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 was um he was a person who ruined people's lives who 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 uh, conned old people out of their life savings and telling them that he had he could give them a guaranteed ten percent interest on their investments or that sort of thing um uh and uh um, and the descriptor of evil comes up occasionally it's not just a he was a bad man or you know he 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 didn't think of us. People refer to him as evil in the course of the the biography, including think, his wife or, yes. or, or first wife. Yeah. Yes, I think he. I, I think he probably was an evil man, and I think David was very. Um, I mean, it's not uh, too much to say warped by this. I mean, he 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 because he loved his father, and his father was the only parent really he knew, and so he felt a loyalty to his father, even when he realized that his father was evil and ruining people's lives and and indeed abusing his own children he groped his own children um i mean i don't know if you know that the, david compared notes with his half-sister charlotte and he said he said to her once did he do it to you charlotte he did it to me um it, it perhaps one shouldn't overstress that i don't think he raped his children but he certainly touched them inappropriately and 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 made them you know, in a in a way that they remembered and with with the yeah. and discovered all their lives. Um, so uh, uh, th this is a man who had no boundaries, um, and uh, and and David, I think, came to think that he had to somehow uh, try and purge this evil. And he, he said he used the metaphor of a bridge. He said, "I am the bridge that my sons must walk over in order to live normal lives." And how how did his children react to to your discoveries? If it's okay to talk about it, I don't know if there's issues with the estate or other stuff that you'd rather not. No, they're not. No, I, don't, I mean, you know, uh, I uh, I don't think there are really issues. I mean, the what happened was that when I was writing the biography, um, things became very difficult with David. And as I say, there at one stage, he seemed to be threatening to. To kill himself, uh, which by which time I was very seriously alarmed. I mean, this of course this is completely outside my experience, and and I, I, I mean, of course, I, I think it was an empty threat, but nevertheless, it was extremely disquieting. Um, and when things became so difficult, uh, David's eldest son Simon um, agreed to act as a mediator and came down to visit me at my home in Bristol and into the house I'm speaking to you from now, and. Uh, and spent a day here, and, and he was the one who proposed this idea of the secret annex, which forms the core of the new book. 
Um, uh, since then, um, I kept in touch with Simon and his brothers, um, including uh, Nick, who's uh, the child of the second marriage. And um, they have read uh, this book in uh, its uh, in typescript version. And um, uh, they said it would make them feel particularly comfortable, but they thought it was a legitimate exercise and um, they w didn't want to stand in my way and indeed wish me well. Um, uh, um, and I'm still in touch with them and, and see them from time to time. So it, 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 it is certainly, um, I think actually it's a tribute to them that they um, are big enough to have accepted this. And I also think that in the long run, although people will not see David in the same reverential way that um, perhaps some people have come, some fans have come to do, um, it won't diminish his literary stature. It may make people think he was a more flawed individual, but then he was a more flawed individual. Yeah, yeah the the lionization of authors like that, that, that sense that they're somehow morally upstanding, I've never understood, but probably because I met authors at, at too young an age. I guess. Well, you're, but, you're realistic. And, and, you know, authors are just like anyone else, only worse. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I think also... Uh, authors, and I include myself in this, though, of course, I'm not a major author, but, but uh, uh, are fundamentally egotistical. And uh, um, one should always remember that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Along those lines, where did biography begin for you? Where did writing, I suppose, uh, professionally begin for you? And then the, the choice to biography? Well, uh, um, it's not a, not a very interesting story, I'm afraid. But I mean, I always liked the idea of being a writer. I was always interested in writing. The, um, I was interested in prose, actually, um, mm -hmm. and um, how prose works and, and making prose better and what was good, what, what made, you know, and interested in people's prose styles, um, even, even as a teenager. Um, and I thought also that I liked the idea of a life of a writer. I liked the idea of the independence of it and um, not being beholden to anyone else, being able to make your own your own life. Um, but um, my attempts at... Uh, I always imagined that I would write fiction, and my attempts at writing fiction were boring even to me. Um, uh, and so I sort of abandoned that idea. And it was I, 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 I did the next best thing, um, which was to work in publishing. Uh, and it was uh, only when I found myself out of a job after something like 15 years as an editor in publishing that I had the idea of writing a biography. And I suddenly thought, this is the thing. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And I find writing biography enriching. I enormously, I, I suppose I'm quite a nosy person, um, but also... Um, I'm interested in people, um, and um, I'm interested in writers, particularly other writers. All my books are about writers. Um, I'm not sure I'd be so good at writing a biography of a, um, you know, a soldier. Just or say a Elon person. Musk or someone like that. But, but yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, all these people have had their interesting sides. But um, uh, I think... Um, you know, uh, I wrote one of my early books was called Boswell's Presumptuous Task about the writing of Boswell's Life of Johnson. And in the closing passages of that book, I say how Boswell managed to make the life of a writer as dramatic and as moving as the life of any you know, um, great individual, any sort of Caesar or um, Hercules or whoever. Um, <laughs> Uh, and um, a, 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 an epic story, um, uh, and he does make Johnson's life an epic story, which is still an extraordinarily reasonable um, and and the first great biography, I think, um, a book today. I, I just picked it up uh, Friday when I was at a, a great bookstore in Detroit. I, I was looking around, like I, I need to see if they have any of Adam's stuff, and I, I picked up your Boswell. Now you've given away the ending, but I'll still. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, there's quite <laughs> sure, a lot in it. Uh, but I, I mean, it's quite interesting with that book, you see, I wrote it almost by accident. I, I had originally thought of writing a biography of Boswell. Um, and um, I sort of, I realized that other people have written biographies of Boswell. There really wasn't anything new about Boswell himself to be said. And I found myself actually writing the biography of a book. 
which was really what was most interesting about Boswell and what he put his whole life into. And when he'd written the book, there was really nothing else left for him, and he died pretty soon after uh, it was published. So, so that, I thought that was in itself a, a dramatic and fascinating story, um, and how somebody who appeared to be an idiot to many of the people around him, and certainly to posterity, um, nevertheless could write a great book. Feel that postpartum depression yourself after you finish <laughs> a, a big one? Uh, what do you mean after, <laughs> Not fatal, uh, after luckily. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's I think it's a strange business when you um, finish a book. Yes, there certainly is a postpartum depression. There's a sort of letting go, but um, usually by the time it's published, you're onto something else. So you you know it's a bit like going back to um, you know, I don't know um, uh, visit an old friend or something. Um, mm-hmm. uh, um, your 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 head is somewhere else um, uh, to some extent. Is, is um, it too much of a jinx to ask what you're working on? I, I, I won't, trust me. Um, you know, if you want to talk about your, your next subject, feel free. But. I, I, I Probably not, but I have no, been working good, on good. something else. And in fact, I was already working on it before I started this book. In fact, this book was obviously waiting to be written because I wrote it very quickly, um, mm-hmm. uh, more quickly than I wrote any, I've written any other book. And I, um, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, and I, I clearly needed to get it out of my system. Yeah. I hope it doesn't read like an act of revenge or getting having the last word, because I don't feel vengeful um, or that I need to score points off David. I mm-hmm. still feel respectful for him, towards him, um, he's obviously a much greater writer than I will ever be, um, uh, and um, uh, I, you know, as a person, he had lots of flaws, but he had lots of wonderful qualities too. Um, and I shall always be pleased that I knew him. But um, I'm quite glad I didn't have an affair with him. <laughs> <laughs> and we won't bring up any potential homoerotic vibe which you address in the the book as opposed in relationships with James Kennaway and and other yes. other male figures in his life but but when it comes to that uh, I'll say competition or however he responded to what you were writing as a biographer David's decision to to put together the pigeon tunnel and try to publish a it would seem preemptive strike of a, a memoir on what you were doing is that something you can talk about i mean you, yes, you, no, certainly. you yeah, refer no, to I'm it in happy, the book happy so. to talk about it i mean quite yeah. a lot of people said to me um they thought it was i mean again to go back to nicholas shakespeare he said he thought it was a monstrous decision um uh, other people said they thought it was um an act of sabotage um uh, my editor when it was announced my editor uh for the biography said said uh he thought that David was trying to win back control of the agenda, which uh, uh, which I think actually was quite an accurate way of putting it. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't allow myself to feel bitter and twisted about it. But partly because you know, it was his life; um, he lived it. Uh, um, he let me write about it, but he had every right to write about it himself. I actually think the Pigeon Tunnel is a not at all a rival to my book. It's not in any way analytical. It has some um, good qualities and some less good qualities. Yeah. I don't think it's very truthful. <laughs> in fact, I'm pretty sure it's, it's some of it is invention. But um, that doesn't mean it isn't very readable. Well, and again, there's that self-invention versus self-deception thing where, as you seem to convey, he... he may believe some of the things that he's telling just because they've been stories think, that he, he put I together. I think he definitely did believe some of them. I, I, sometimes, I, I wonder whether he ever consciously lied as such. I think he was... Uh, uh, part of the thing about having a, a novelist's imagination is that you do envisage your creations more fully. And once you envisage them, they, in a way, become real. Um, uh it's it, it that's a, that's a very um yeah, odd process it's sort of analogous to um seeing your characters portrayed on film where they um then you know the the film 
because the visual medium is so powerful that the film person begins to take over, just like Alec Guinness began to take over the character of George Smiley. Um, uh, um, so um, I think that happens. And so I think that he, you know, when he imagined something, he then began to believe that was true, um, even when it wasn't, in fact, de demonstrably in many cases wasn't. Yeah, sort of forming his own cover story and then coming to believe it. Yeah. Yes, that's a very good way of putting it, because, of course, he had been an intelligence uh, operative. Um, uh, and um, as he himself said, uh, people who become spies have to have a, an element of uh, larceny about them. They, they, um, they have to be uh, loyal, but they also have to be deceitful. This is a long-standing thing I've, I've joked about in my life that I used to treat my friends like terrorist cells, where you know uh, they would each get a piece of the story, but you know, God forbid, they ever came together and could actually compare notes. At which point, they'd either figure out where I was lying or, or sort of put the full story together. Uh, which you mentioned, I, I think, when one of his um, one of the women in his life ends up connecting with uh, uh, his former publisher in Charles Pick, yes, and they. Yes. They end up having some conversations about, boy, he would really be unhappy if he knew we were talking to each other. Yes. And one yeah. of the things about David is that pretty much everybody who ever connected with him in any way, including me, feels that a bit of them, a bit of the story is not complete. They feel a bit... They feel unhappy that it's it's not uh, there's no full conclusion, and I think every everyone is left with that. Um, uh, I've never met anyone who who had any involvement with David who doesn't feel some sense of that. Maybe because he himself was an incomplete person. I don't know. How did you feel about this book and and what you? I say what you learned in the process of of the secret life. I mean, these were all things you knew that you'd already uncovered through the research, but the process of, of writing this, you mentioned how quickly it, it uh, came together for you, but did you come to a, a new understanding through the process of writing this, or was it pretty much who you thought you knew as of 2014, 15? I think it was pretty much, I mean, to some, there's a little bit of joining up the dots, but it was pretty much what I knew already. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, um, I uh, there were there were no startling revelations yeah. for, for me. Um, uh, there were just a few connections that I had half made or not completely made. Um, uh, that that was all there was. Um, uh, I didn't know when I started this whether it was a book or just a long article. I thought maybe it was a long article, um, uh, and um, so I was pleased to find it became a book. It's a short book, but it is a book, I think. Oh, yes, very much. It 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 has a unity to itself that would not have functioned in a even if it was a, a twenty thousand word piece or something. You you put something significant together here. Do you plan on working with a on on dead biographical subjects in the <laughs> future, or or are you still looking at at, at live ones? <laughs> well, it's such a it's such a difficult problem, isn't it? I mean, of course. It's a, um, sorry, it's not a difficult problem. What I mean is it's a tantalizing choice because yeah. um, obviously it's much easier to work with someone who isn't um, looking over your shoulder all the time um, uh, or indeed um, uh, doing more than looking over your shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, but um, at the same time, to have someone there who, when you don't understand something, you come across something that, that is... Uh, um, or you uh, a dead end or something that you can question to get, be able to interrogate your subject. That that's a huge advantage. So it's it's um, I, it, it's a bit of both. And I would certainly contemplate writing about a living author again, but I would um, go into it with my eyes open um, as a result of this experience. <laughs> Yeah, how much do you feel from your experience with other biographers you know and other writers you know that this author in particular was going to to be thorny? We'll, we'll say compared to to other potential subjects. I think that um, I mean I was warned at the outset that by Robert Harris, who had yeah. a plan to write and a contract indeed to write David Cornwall's biography for twenty years. 
um, uh, and and didn't do it, but did do some research towards it, um, that I would never be able to publish in David's lifetime. And perhaps in a sense he was correct, although in another sense, of course, he wasn't correct. Perhaps only now have I been able to publish the full story. Um, uh, um, sorry, remind me of the question. Um, the sense of now I'm blanking. The, the, well, I, I really wanted to ask, you know, how much did you know this was going to be? He of all authors would be particularly difficult to to try oh, to, to yes. create a life. Uh, of. Well, as I say, I was warned by Robert, but I didn't. I it, it wasn't until I had met him and um, that I realised um, uh, quite um, well. Apart from anything else, how clever and yet how manipulative. He was the the the, the great uh, Bob Gottlieb. Um, I, uh, do I need to explain who Bob? Gottlieb oh no, no, is? I, I, yeah. <laughs> People who listen to my show know who Bob, Bob yeah, Gottlieb yeah. is. <laughs> well, the great Bob Gottlieb, who was David's editor for many years, and um, um, probably the editor that David respected the most. So that's not saying very much. Um, uh, um, uh, said to me that his experience when he met David was. Uh, his reaction was, this man is very, very clever, possibly the cleverest man I ever met. And if you, know, if you think of all the very clever people that Bob met, that's a huge statement. Mm -hmm. And the only way I'm going to be able to work with him is if I'm completely straightforward with him. And I can't hope to put anything over on him because it just won't work. Um, that's pretty much exactly what Bob said to me. Um, we talked a lot about David in lots of ways, um, uh, and but um, that's the essence of his reaction to David at the start. Um, I didn't have, I should say, meet Bob until I was well into writing the project. So um, by then it was, um, I was already on the hook, so to yeah. speak. Um, but um, yeah, I knew he was going to be tricky. Um, and uh, he was tricky, but then it was quite enjoyable trickiness. As I mean, even when I felt I was being manipulated, I quite enjoyed it. He would do things like uh, he would sometimes say, "Well, if I were you writing my biography, <laughs> the question I'd be asking me now would be," and I would, I'd kind of lick my lips and think, "Hmm." I need to think yeah, carefully why would about... I, why, why would he want me as me to write? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He would also have a disarming... He'd, he'd, he'd let slip some little kind of statement which suggested that he knew more about me than I had told him, um, that he'd in some sense been spying on me. Um, yeah. uh, and that that was one of his little tricks, uh, disarming. You know, right. uh, to, I think I told you in our initial correspondence that Ruth Skur had cited a quote of mine from the the, the web page that I, I use about the the podcast that I thought, oh wait, biographers are actually going to pay attention to details when when they're going to talk to someone. Not that you're all detectives, but uh, nonetheless, I was I was um, worried that I'd be called out on some of the things that I use as sort of off the cuff remarks about this stuff. But but yeah, yes. that's um, yes, that's, I suppose that's that that, that yes yeah. I mean, we are a bit like detectives. I, I, often, I sometimes use that analogy, but we're a bit like psychoanalysts, um, mm -hmm. uh, priests. Um, I mean, there is a, quite an interesting parallel with interrogators too. Um, I mean, this is something that interests David quite a lot, and some of his uh, best scenes are scenes of interrogation, um, as when um, Smiley interrogates oh, Grigori and the, towards the end of uh, uh, yeah. Smiley's people um, or when Smiley interrogates Carla and fails to... That's, that's the one. That That's yeah. the one that I think is one of the strongest scenes he's ever done. But Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and, and so... Um, and David himself had done a lot of interrogation, particularly um, when, before he, he joined um, uh, British Intelligence but was working for the... Um, doing his national service in occupied Austria and interrogating uh, refugees from the East. Um, he was working for, I uh, can't remember what it was called, the Field Security Service, I think. Um, um, and so he would be in the front line of, in, uh, of interviewing these people who could be perfectly normal refugees or they could be communist plants, um, uh, moles, um, yeah. uh, getting ready to bury themselves in the heart of Western 
um, institutions. And it raises that question, and it, it it's weird, but the interview that came out last week between David Marchese and Errol Morris, which, again, I don't want to put you on any weird spot for, but where they discuss the difference between how each of them sees the differences between interviews and interrogations, and then the goal of interviews themselves. It raises the question for me, were there ever points when you were interviewing David where you know he was saying something false? And did you oh. confront oh, yes. him at the time or did you hold off and wonder why he was, whether he was knowingly telling you something false? Well, both really. But I mean, yeah. for example, one of my memories was of, um, it started off in a completely non-confrontational, it wasn't really a confrontation, but we, we actually had uh, the pattern of our um, interviews was usually I'd go and see him in the late morning and we'd talk for an hour or two hours, and then we'd go and have some lunch, usually at a local pub or restaurant. Uh, and we just arrived at a local restaurant uh, and uh, were sitting down, and he started to tell me how, after he had got his degree from Oxford, he went to teach at Eton. Uh, uh, I don't know if your listeners will be familiar. Eton is the grandest of uh, private schools in, um, uh, where um, the, the sons of the aristocracy or indeed royalty um, um, ascent. Um, Anyway, uh, and he started telling me this, and I interrupted him rather brusquely and said, I I'm sorry, David, I, uh, that's not what happened. Uh, I, I know because last week I was reading the files on, on this. And uh, he looked very disturbed. And uh, it was clear to me that he wasn't trying to lie to me, that he believed what the story that he'd been telling, and that he was very disconcerted to find that it wasn't true. So um, that was that was an example of, I suppose, not there was no great subtlety on my part. It just happened that I, I knew knew what was true and and, and seen it in the files. I'm I'm a skeptic about the truth of interviews. I uh, um, in in general, I think that people um, we're all always massaging the past and manipulating it to fit the present and. Um, uh, um, and I'm a I'm much greater believer in written records to, uh, from the time. But, um, but interviews can be useful for other reasons, um, not least by in, in directing you towards other records, um, but also helping to place them in some kind of context. What did you have to learn as far as, as interviewing and building rapport and then about research, which I'll get to uh, after that? Uh, well, I had done quite a lot of think, it. Oh, I had done quite on. a lot of it before. I yeah. mean, um, you know, uh, in writing biographies, albeit of people that um, had died, but I interviewed their widows or children or friends or colleagues, um, many, many such people. I remember when I was writing my first book, which was a biography of the British historian A.J.P. Taylor, um, quite early on, I was sitting with uh, his daughter and uh, she clearly was upset and she started crying and I was astonished this is my first realization that I was actually talking about somebody's father and somebody that, that a figure who was abstract to me who I had never met or even seen was a real person and, 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 and occupied an, a central place in the life of others and it, it was a very solitary um, reminder to me uh, that, that something that for me was abstract for other people um, was very personal and I've always tried to remember that and, and I feel that to that extent biography is a humane process, it's not just a scientific or historical process it, it, it has to be done with a measure of gentleness Discretion, kindness, um, consideration, I mean, all of those, politeness, all, all of those come into it at one stage or another. Yeah. And again, the the I can imagine the criticism of this book as the, oh, he's doing the salacious, you know, private life. Thing. If anything, in that same interview with Morris uh, and Marchese, Morris goes on about how he's not interested in, in discussing Le Carre's sex life and and 
why is it important, et cetera, you know, I think you really make a strong biographical case for what's here and why this book needs to to be the the annex or companion to to the biography. I um, mean, I, I in the sense that I am feel able to comment at all on that interview, I would say that Errol, who I who I met and and, and, and talked to a little bit about um, the film, um, uh, um, is sensitive to the. Uh, criticism that he might have given David too easy a ride, whether it's about his personal life or about uh, other aspects of his life, um, and and that is what seemed to to me to um, annoy him so much. Um, however, this is um, yeah. speculation. It's, it's, yeah, I, I, if I ever get him on the show, we'll we'll talk about it. But yeah. your your books did seem like the undertext of that interview that neither author was or neither uh, person was mentioning, but. But that might be me being oversensitive. Well, and reading I mean, there way may be much. a truth in that because I, I, I had sent a copy to Errol um, mm. of my book uh, sometime before that interview. Um, but I don't know. I have no, yeah. you know, I haven't spoken to No worries. Since. That's, that's, you know, I, I, if anything, I found it fascinating because it was the question of what is an interview really for? And having those guys both hash it out was was fascinating to me uh regardless of whether it was about yes. david or or another subject have you seen um, the film no they conveniently set that up to come out four days before your book <laughs> which <laughs> i also had a little huh is this the other pigeon tunnel moment where it's the you know uh well, again, I think that, that, it, no, but i i'm very pleased because it's okay. you know it creates extra interest in david uh, and i must say when i saw the film i found it rather therapeutic for me yeah. personally because there's david um at ease laughing smiling um i felt happy to see him that way um uh um having kind of you know known that his last few years were pretty tough in various ways yeah. um so that, that was good good I'm, I'm glad it doesn't have the same uh, uh, fraught framework that the, uh, the the pigeon tunnel the pigeon tunnel book did. So. Yeah, except I didn't really get upset about the the pigeon tunnel book. I mean, in the way that other people seem to be upset on my behalf. I mean, I do think it it may have damaged me in in some ways. I think that it put foreign publishers off, um, uh, foreign language publishers off taking my book. I think I'm pretty certain that that's the truth because. When it came to the Frankfurt Book Fair, um, you know, they were faced with a choice of do you want Sisman or do you want the real thing? Well, you know, who wouldn't want the real thing? Um, sure. Um, uh, but um, actually, the real thing turned out to be something quite different from Sisman. And so um, uh, you, you could easily have both. <laughs> yeah. That's my argument anyway. I'm, I'm glad to have read them both. I read The Pigeon Tunnel years ago and, and only tackled your biography recently and then uh the the new book um and th there were those moments of did i read this before oh yeah no no david told his version of this story and you know i'm gonna take adam's version as the one that's actually been researched and vetted as best you can there so. was a really weird moment actually which is kind of topical now i suppose which is about when he uh has a chapter in the pigeon tunnel about going to interview a terrorist um uh, not a Palestinian terrorist, but a terrorist for the Palestinian cause being held in an Israeli prison. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember what he entitles that chapter. But anyway, um, when he read the manuscript of my book, he said, uh, I don't want you to use that story. Um, I'm saving that for my memoir. Uh, and I pointed out to him that uh, he'd already used it himself um, <laughs> in, in a fictionalized version in... in um, the secret pilgrim um so i said david in a way you're plagiarizing yourself <laughs> and yeah, he, yeah he i think that, and that may be my, my double resonance with i'm sure i've read this before and I'm, i yeah couldn't couldn't correspond whether it was that story or the 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 smiley yeah so it made me wonder anytime. actually whether it was really true at all whether uh, you know he hadn't it wasn't actually a piece of fiction that he'd factionalized um, who knows but yeah two questions left uh first your favorite Le Carre book? Oh, dear. That's like Doesn't saying, what's your best. favorite color? Um, <laughs> I, I can name three or four favorites. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, obviously, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold is a... Is a, is a, it was a first of all, it was a book that changed his life. And it's still a terrific book. I mean, it's so yeah. powerful and bleak. 
um, and um, uh, 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 it made an enormous impact on me um, when I read it. Um, uh, I think Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy is a wonderfully written, uh, um, complex, um, rich book. Uh, the Perfect Spy is a uh, an extraordinary work, and and although it's in the it's ba it's really not really a spy book at all. It's it, it's it's a it's it's a it's it's a novel. Um, it's a complex novel um, about somebody having a breakdown. Yeah, it's the, I figured those would be a good top three to to go with of the non smiley books. Otherwise, um, I, I'm taking your work because I haven't read it yet. Tailor of Panama. At least as best post Cold War, or no, I don't think so. The Taylor of Panama is a sort of homage to um, Our Man in Havana, um, and it's sort of black comedy partly. I don't think it really works, and and I I never laughed in it. Um, Mm -hmm. Black comedy is very difficult to do, I think. Um, uh, So. I just heard a click. Did you hear a click? No, no, we're we're good. Oh, it may have been my wife coming home, but that's oh, right. um, <laughs> the the exigencies of doing this remotely. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. The uh, um, uh, are you asking me what what well, are the non smiley? Fa- yeah, yeah, your fave non smiley, non perfect spy. We can't say uh, post Cold War, I guess, but yeah. uh, well, we can say post Cold War. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, I mean, I like you know, the night manager is is uh, it's too long. It's too complicated, but it is. I mean, it is a, a, a fascinating and, and, and compelling book. Um, I quite like um, uh, um, our kind. Uh, do I don't mean our kind of traitor? A most wanted man mm-hmm. uh, of, of the late books, uh, which is about rendition set in Germany, um, uh, and um, that, that's that. Uh, uh, but in general, I, I prefer the Cold War books. I think that was when, I mean, I think, I know it's a cliche, but I think when the Cold War ended, David did lose his subject um, and um, he never really found it again. Um, he, after that, he was a very good spy novelist, but he wasn't a great novelist anymore. And last question, which I should have warned you was coming and doesn't have to be related to anything you're working on. What are you reading? Oh, uh, what am I reading at the moment? Uh, uh, I'm just reading a book by a man called Gerald Brennan called uh, um, South from Granada, um, uh, uh, which is a strange book, a sort of memoir um, of um, Gerald Brennan fought in the First World War uh, as a young man, and uh, he just was repelled by English society as, as he found it um, uh, at the end of the First World War. And he went to live in a very remote village in Spain um, uh, in a very sort of primitive... He reckoned he could live there on almost nothing, and, and he could. And um, uh, he uh, immersed himself in in the, the life of this village, which in some ways was very much the life um, as it had been since the Middle Ages, um, and which was about to change um, uh, with the 20th century, the advance of the 20th century. And one of the curious things about it is that Brendan was well connected with the Bloomsbury Group and, and was visited by grandees such as Virginia Woolf, Lytton Strachey, and Bertrand Russell, uh, Augustus John, and so on, um, wow. who all turned up at this in this tiny village where there was, you know, there were no, there was no uh, running water. Um, there were there were very limited facilities, and very limited, and not not many comforts. Um, yeah. uh, um, so that's uh, that's what I'm reading at the moment. I, I should, by the way, as a uh, aside about the biography itself, because uh, it reminds me of when David takes the family to Greece to, to live so they can get oh, out yes. of the, the UK for a while. And all the harrowing depictions you have of what the what what the residence was like, what the conveniences or inconveniences were like, without ever quite getting to the point of what his wife must have thought of all that while he was off 
well, I've dumped the family in Greece. I'm going to go off and, and you know, start consulting on novels and, and movies. And, and it was just this harrowing, oh, God, what she must have been going through. Yes, I think it was too <laughs> tough on her and, and with young children as well. I mean, the thing was that then at that, I mean, it's basically you went abroad for tax reasons. The tax rates yeah. in Britain in the early, the mid-60s were punitive, on, especially on people for people who had suddenly made money. And quite a number of best-selling authors fled England to somewhere, um, were advised by their accountants, you, because there was a kind of thing called super tax, which I think was a, at a rate of something like 95%. Yeah, um, yeah. so the numbers yeah. that you, you included were absolutely nuts, just in terms it, of it, anything it was, over X amount was... Yes, was, yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm not generally very sympathetic with complaints from the, the extremely rich about being overtaxed, but th that did seem a bit ridiculous yeah. and, and 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 so that's why they went there but i mean and, and but they went to a part of crete and that was uh, that now is very fashionable and where i know several authors um well-known authors who um who um, have houses in that part of crete but back then it was very primitive indeed and uh, um david almost as soon as he got there started plotting to get out <laughs> <laughs> but not bringing Anne with him, which, no. again, gets us back to the secret life of John le Carré, I guess. But, Adam, thanks so much for the, the conversation and and for following up the biography. Like I've, I've hinted at throughout this, um, I think this this annex makes the, the first book more complete in a way that uh, I get why it had to be the way it was the, the first time around. But I'm, I'm very glad you had this opportunity to, to produce the new book. Well, thank you. I, I'm so pleased that you say that because that's exactly how I feel. Um, but it's very nice to have your endorsement. <laughs> and I'm hoping we'll get together in person for uh, another conversation down the line. Again, that, I won't that, stress that you about an next book. Or even not down the line or even in person in due course. <laughs> And that was Adam Sisman. You really ought to read his, his big biography of John le Carré, John le Carré, the biography, and this new follow-up, The Secret Life of John le Carré. They're both from Harper's. Um, go get them. Go watch that Errol Morris documentary. I haven't seen it yet. Um, Morris did not talk about uh, David Cornwall's private life, which led to a, a really contentious interview he had with David Marchese in the New York Times. That's a whole thing in and of itself. Adam and I did not discuss that even off mic, so... Don't worry. Anyway, I picked up uh, Adam's Boswell book last week when I was in Michigan uh, during a client meeting. I'm looking forward to checking that out, as well as his 2020 book, The Professor and the Parson. And even when we talked off mic, he didn't give me a clue about what he's working on next. He, he kind of did give me a clue, but I did not follow up on it. Um, but anyway, I can't wait to see what he, he writes next. And I'm glad. Well, I'm glad to say Adam is not on social media. Um, we all know that's a good thing. And it's probably how one can actually write without real interruption like this, uh, unless that's a bit of tradecraft and he's actually got burner accounts all over the place. But I'm going to say he's no spy. He has put the Le Carre stuff behind him and he is uh, headed towards a brand new biographical project. Now, you can support the Virtual Memory Show by telling other people about it. Let them know there's this podcast comes out every week, even when the host is off traveling, and that uh, it's got really fascinating conversations with interesting cultural figures. You can also help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it, who you'd like to hear me record with, or what movie or TV show or book or piece of music or theater or art exhibition or, or whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. You can do that by sending me an email, a DM if we're connected on social media, a postcard or a letter. My mailing address is at the end of the substack I send out twice a week. Or by leaving a message on my Google Voice number, which is 973-869-9659. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And messages can be up to three minutes long. You go longer than that, it'll cut you off, so just call back and leave a second message. And let me know if it would be okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show. You might have something interesting to share with listeners, but I would never include something like that without the speaker's permission. So uh, let me know. If you've got money to spare, don't give it to me. I have a day job. It treats me pretty well. Um, I've got a Patreon. I've got a Substack with a paid tier. Uh, there are links to all that stuff. Um, if you want to 
give to the cause. That's cool. But really help out other people. Um, there are individuals and institutions in need all the time that you can help uh, with people. You can help through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Crowdfunder, and all those crowdfunding platforms. And when you go to those, you'll find people who need help with rent or medical bills or vet bills or uh, car payment or getting an artistic project off the ground. There might be a book there that a publisher is trying to launch that you can help make happen. Um, so there's all sorts of things you can do that way. And when it comes to institutions, uh, I give to my local food bank every month, make occasional contributions to, to other charities, uh, the Poor People's Campaign, Freedom Funds, Election Funds, Women's Choice. Um, also, I make targeted election contributions, but I'm a lobbyist, so that's part of my day job. But uh, what I'm saying is you know, there's a lot of things you can do with your, your money and time to, to help build a better world. So uh, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, Talk it up on social media and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going.